Okay. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Just wave your hand around if I'm too quiet or too loud. <laughs> Thank you for joining us tonight and welcome to the third Raising the Bar Adelaide event. Uh, I'm Madge Green and on behalf of the City of Norwood, Paynham and St Peter's, we're very excited to bring Evangeline Mantisorius to the maid tonight to present her talk, When Food Plays Mind Games. For those of you who have not attended a Raising the Bar Adelaide event before, this is an initiative started in New York with the intention to turn pubs and classrooms, oh, sorry, pubs into classrooms by combining education and pop culture. This event has been around the world from Hong Kong, London, Auckland, Sydney, and we're proud to bring it to Adelaide once again. There are nine other pubs and bars around the Norwood Paynham St Peter's Council area tonight, all hosting talks by academics and esteemed speakers, and most of the events will be live streamed, as ours is as well, I believe, yes. So when we do the questions and answers, I will be giving a microphone to whoever wants to ask a question. So if you just maybe pop your hand up and then I can bring the mic over, that would be great. Um, and they'll be live streamed onto each pub's Facebook page if you want to find those uh, later on. The talks will also be all able to be viewed following the event, so we welcome you to view the other talks that may be of interest to you. Um, the list of the other talks is on the Norwood Payne and St Peter's website. Uh, we hope you enjoy your night and don't forget to share your experience and photos via social media with the hashtag RTBADL. So raise the bar, Adelaide, RTBADL. Thank you. I hope you enjoy your night and now I'd like to hand over to Evangeline. Thank you everybody and it's great to see such a huge crowd here, more than I get at lectures, so that's always really encouraging. <laughs> but I've got to say, you're very brave. I notice some people are eating meals and to eat your dinner whilst the dietitian is talking can substantially put you off your meal, so I apologise up front if that occurs. Just a little bit about my background. Um, I'm an accredited practicing dietitian, which means I have spent five years studying the science of nutrition and the application of nutrition is called dietetics. Um, after I did my science and dietetic degree, I sort of remained a sucker for the education process and did my PhD in fatty acids and inflammation. Um, since that time, I have worked in numerous hospitals, run a private practice, done research, and also worked at all three universities. And currently, I'm the program director for nutrition and food sciences at UniSA. Um, very lucky to be there. It's, it's just fantastic to be able to work in an area that you're passionate about. And I have been passionate about the area of nutrition and food and health since about mid-high school. And it was something I always wanted to get into. And I can happily say it's not bored me yet because new things pop up all the time. We also have um, lots of people out there in the internet, the ether, um, who sort of provide a lot of commentary for us to be able to refute. And I don't know that I need to specify names of who those people are, but it always gives us a lot of material to work with. So heading into tonight's topic. Tonight's topic is when food controls your mind. Um, and you might be thinking, well, what am I specifically talking about? Because if you see an ad for chocolate, it sort of persists with you, doesn't it? You try to find that chocolate in the cupboard and you're trying to find it. So it does control your mind in that way. And advertising is very clever at doing that and using the right sort of messages and you know, audio and visual messages to get your attraction to keep your mind on the chocolate. The other thing, of course, that it could be is eating disorders. And that's quite a serious condition where people become um, quite, um, you know, controlled by what they should eat and when they should eat and attaining a certain body image. But we're not talking about that either tonight. Um, 
The other thing is that food plays a really special role in our life, as you know. It controls us at all levels. We plan for it. We think about it all the time. For those of you that were going to come and have a meal here, you're probably thinking about what were you going to eat and thinking about that. So, you know, food is pretty big in our environment. What we're talking about is how food controls your mind. Now, I notice most of you have got a glass of alcohol on the table in your hands. And we know that alcohol controls our mind, right? We know that it reduces social inhibition, it makes you more relaxed, and it can also make you more aggressive. The other thing that can control your mind, and you know, you're all doing it, is caffeine. So when you get up in the morning, your first thought is, when will I get my next coffee so I can be semi-human, okay? You might find that you need a cup of coffee towards the end of this talk if I'm starting to bore you. So that's one of the things that it keeps us alert. And it does that by being ingested. It goes through our digestive tract, like alcohol does. It's absorbed in from the small intestine, and then it's distributed around the body and it has its effect. So caffeine has its effect by going to the brain, and what it does is it competes for a receptor that makes you sleepy. And so instead of adenosine, this chemical binding to that receptor, alcohol binds to that receptor, but it doesn't do anything to that receptor, so you don't actually feel sleepy when you have coffee. Alcohol, same thing. It needs to be absorbed into your stomach, it goes through to the small intestine, and then it circulates around the body. Normally, for an average healthy person, you need about 30 minutes from the time that you've ingested it to start feeling the effects of the alcohol or the caffeine, okay? But both of them control minds. And you can probably think of other things that control your mind, but specifically looking at food, there's magic mushrooms, um, there's also things like um, nutmeg, and nutmeg at high level can be a hallucinatory agent as well. We've also got rye grain, and rye grain's a really interesting one. If rye grain is stored under humid conditions, a fungus can grow. And this fungus produces chemicals, and if they're ingested, it actually causes hallucinations. Now you're going, oh, well, when does rye ever get moist and cause this problem? Well, the interesting thing is, it's what they believe caused the um, symptoms for people that were called witches, okay? So those hallucinations, those wild, vivid dreams they were having, they believe it's because these women were consuming rye grain that had gone mouldy and was producing this. So, you know, has a huge impact. Then there's other things like kava, which has got a calming agent as opposed to all the others we've had. And then also poppy seeds. And we know about poppy seeds. If you love your orange and poppy seed muffins, you might be worried about how many you are having. But there's different grades of poppy seeds which have different levels of opium in them. But all of these need to be eaten, swallowed, into your stomach, emptied from your stomach, in your small intestine, and then absorbed into your blood to have an effect. Now, I'm just going to go back to a little bit of science. And I did warn you there would be a bit of science in this. What is food used for? And I know we're meant to have mics, but I was hoping to get a bit of audience participation. So you've indicated muscle. So is that what you mean, to build muscles? Yeah. Energy, absolutely. So food, the macronutrients, carbohydrate, fat and protein, as well as alcohol, contribute to the energy that we need to function every day. It also provides all the basic units of life we need, the amino acids, the sugars, the fatty acids, the vitamins, the minerals, and all the other phytonutrients that are in food to help build our body to what it is at the moment. So just reflect on it. Your body has been entirely made up from the food you've consumed. Okay, so, you know, you put rubbish in. I know it's a bit depressing, right? Put rubbish in, you get rubbish out. So food plays a real critical role in our health. Now, the main thing, as you pointed out, was the energy. And energy is really critical. So whether we consume protein, fat, carbohydrate or alcohol, our body will convert all of those macronutrients back to the basic unit of glucose. And that's because the most readily available energy source for our muscles when we need to do something straight away is glucose. We also use fatty acids, but that's at a slower level. So for those of you that go at the gym and they have the fat burning zone on the 
you know, on the bicycles and the rowing machines and you've got to get up really high to get that fat burning zone, that's actually false. You're burning fat if you've not eaten your dinner. For those who've eaten dinner, sorry, you're feeling really picked on right now, you're actually burning glucose because that's what you've absorbed in. But if we're in a fasted state, we're burning fat. So you're more likely to burn fat two or three hours after your meal. But once again, we get that energy from eating it, swallowing it, it goes into our stomach, the digestive process begins, it's emptied into our small intestine, and from there, all these nutrients are absorbed into the bloodstream, and they go to the different parts of the body that need them. The glucose is used for energy straight away. Okay? Now, energy, everybody uses it. We're in the midst of AFL Grand Final, and sorry to all the Port Power supporters who didn't get their team into the Grand Final, but nutrition in sport is a really huge um, consideration by the professional teams now. It gives that edge. It can make, you know, um, the full forward jump higher to mark the ball. It will make the rover run quicker to get to the ball ahead of his opponent. And even if you get to the ball, half a second before your opponent, you're winning. You mark the ball ahead of your opponent, you've got a better chance of kicking a goal. And if you can kick the football further, you've got more chance of getting goals. So nutrition is really intricately implicated in performance. And it's just, just not about athletes. It's also what we call occupational athletes. And they're people who have really heavy duties in their work. For example, your star force officers, your firemen, policemen, army officers, who may have unpredictable hours of work. So they don't know how long they will be doing a job and when they will next be able to access food. So sports nutrition is really big. So to be effective in sports nutrition or to perform or to exercise or to train, we need to actually get that energy into the blood and get that glucose to the working muscles that need it. But what if we could improve performance by not actually absorbing that glucose that we're eating. What do you think? Is it possible from your food? Obviously it is, because I'm about to talk about it, right? <laughs> so, a bit more science. Your tongue. Your tongue, if you've looked at it closely in the mirror when you wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth, you see there's a whole lot of papillae on them. And in those, we've got taste receptors. And there's a whole lot of different taste receptors on your tongue. Um, and they taste things like salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and then that umami flavour you get from mushrooms and meat and tomato, you know, that savoury thing. But these receptors, they taste these foods. And why do they taste the food? Of course, we enjoy the taste of food. We'll select different dishes because of, you know, what our taste preferences are. But we're also beginning to learn a lot more about these receptors. They're really fancy cells, and inside this cell, there's something in there called a G protein. And this G protein is really quite clever. What it's able to do is detect substances that you're consuming and then send messages to your brain about what you're eating. These G um, proteins in the receptor cells are so amazing that research has actually led to 10 Nobel Prizes just on this G protein. Okay, so quite amazing stuff. So let's go back to my original question. What if you could have something, not digest it, and perform better from it? What do you think? Well, one of the things that you do, and who's been watching the footy? Have you been watching the footy? Have you noticed that athletes, not just footy, soccer, they take a swig and then they spit it out? Have you noticed that? Yeah. What they're actually doing, in the biz what we call in the business, is rinse and spitting. And what happens is they're consuming a solution that's got somewhere between 6 to 8% glucose in it, and they swirl it in their mouth for about 10 seconds. And in that 10 seconds, the magic begins on the tongue. The receptors detect the sweet taste, and they send a message to the brain. Now, there's lots of different parts of the brain, and the research shows us that it actually activates different parts of the brain. And they know that it actually activates different parts of the brain by what they call functional MRI. So someone is having a magnetic 
resonance imaging and they're actually drinking it and they can see what part of the brain activates. And the parts of the brain that are activated are the bits that are associated with fatigue, reward and motor control. Okay? And what happens is that these parts of the brain get the message that there's a sweetness coming on board to the body and activate to the muscles to tell them to work harder. Okay? And so what we see when we do experiments looking at um, athletes who are performing in a controlled laboratory situation, whether they're on a bike, whether they're on a treadmill, whether they're kicking a football, is that they actually perform better if they do this rinse and swirl. Okay? So they have more power and, they have, um, and they're faster. So there's improvements and that's what you want, right? on the field. That's what you want your athlete to be able to achieve, is to be able to perform better so that they can, um, you know, win the game. Now, I said you can drink alcohol here in the pub and that you can have coffee, but you can't rinse and spit because I think they'd probably throw us out if everyone tried this technique. The other interesting thing about this rinse and spit is that even if they give the athletes artificially sweetened drinks, we still see the same effect. So what it seems to be is that the body is detecting the sweet taste rather than the actual sugar. Because when they give them products that aren't sweet tasting, they don't get this effect. So plain water doesn't have this effect, for example. And so that's led into a whole lot of interesting research about how does this affect other physiological responses in the body. So why is it that this happens? There must be an evolutionary basis to why we have this happening. Because 10, 20,000 years ago when we were evolving, we weren't playing footy, we weren't kicking goals and we weren't running. But what we were doing was running away from man-eating animals, right? So if we tasted something sweet, it gave us the ability to work harder to get more of that sweet ingredient, which our body recognises as being really helpful for energy. But the other thing it does is it allowed that sudden burst of activity to occur, which is really, really critical. So what they're doing at is looking at what the impact of sugar and artificial sweeteners are in other areas of health. So I hate to say how long I've been practising for, but it's about, you know, 30 or so years that I've been in this area. And when I first started as a dietitian, artificially sweetened products just started to hit the market. And we were really excited about this because it meant for all those patients we had that had diabetes, and just to add, 30 years ago, we never saw diabetes in anyone under the age of 65. It was definitely an old person's disease, okay? When I had my last clinic 20 years later, the last person I saw in that clinic was a 16-year-old girl who had type 2 diabetes, so not the genetical form, the one that's acquired and was on insulin. So that's a real big change. But going back to when we originally had artificial sweeteners, we were really excited because we thought, great, all these people with diabetes can enjoy Coke, they can enjoy a dessert that's got artificial sweeteners in, and it won't affect their blood glucose level. But what we found was it did. It was still impacting on it. And the research really hasn't clarified why that's the case whether people eat in compensation, so they say, well, I'll have the Coke No Zero and I'll have the cake to go with it, or whether it activates this system to release more glucose into the blood and cause you know, more work to be done, we're not certain. The other thing we know about these receptors in the mouth, they're not actually just on the tongue. They're all down your gastrointestinal system. So the detection occurs all the way down about what you're consuming is they also seem to count calories, which is a fascinating thing. So that whole thing about people losing their awareness of how many calories they're going in and out, it's unknown why that's happened because theoretically the research field thinks that we might be able to count the calories by these receptors. But that's a really evolving area of research. So rinse and spit is what we call it. So have we got any people here that work out or play sport? Yep. So, 6 to 8% carbohydrate solution, about 10 seconds of swirling, and it needs to be done every 10 minutes. Interestingly, it also works better when you're in the fasted state. 
which makes sense as to provide that energy when there isn't any on board. But you might say, well, when is an athlete ever fasted? Surely they're going to go into a game having, eat, you know, having eaten so they can sustain themselves for the length of the game. But there's various reasons that athletes may not do it. One of it is they might get GI discomfort, and some of the GI discomfort can be quite debilitating. There's upper GI discomfort, but there's also lower GI discomfort. And that's what we call the trotter's run. And literally, they can defecate whilst they're running with no knowledge. So they may choose not to eat for that very reason. The other reason is religious or cultural reasons. So if it's Ramadan and the athlete doesn't want to eat during the Ramadan period, they can use the rinse and spit. And that was a big concern in the 2012 London Olympics where it was held over the Ramadan period. Also not for the athletes, but also for the you know, referees who would potentially be adjudicating during a, um, you know, whilst they haven't eaten. Um, so lots of reasons why an athlete might be fasted. But it might also be because of the game. So in soccer, the game lasts for two 45-minute quarters. So the sports dietitian for the team will know this and will ensure that each athlete gets the right amount they need to last them for the 45 minutes. And then they'll get something at half time to keep them going again. But what if the game goes to a draw and they've got extra time? See, that's the problem. So then things like rinse and spit can be really useful because it will sustain the athlete for 10 minutes at a time. So what else? So we've talked about the carbohydrates, but there's also mint and menthol. So this is a really, really interesting one. There's a different, there's lots and lots of taste receptors in our tongue. And there's one that detects mint. And all of you have had mint, right? Yep. And, when, and the ads always tell us we'll feel refreshed after we've had mint. Have you remember those ads, that couple in the bed and they're looking really daggy and they have a mint chewy and they look really classy? They've been refreshed by the mint, right? Well, they're kind of sort of right because what the evidence shows us is that these taste receptors for mint actually trigger the brain and make the brain think it's colder. Now, how is this useful for an athlete or for anyone? Well, for an athlete, when it's hot and there's extreme heat or humidity, our performance drops quite significantly in extreme heat. So an athlete trying to run in a marathon, you know, will be feeling really hot, and the hotter you get, the worse your performance becomes. Your power drops, your perceived if, um, feeling on how much effort you've put into the thing will also decrease. So there's lots of reason. In fact, if COVID-19 hadn't happened, and how many times are we saying that this year, and the Tokyo 2020 Olympics were going to be on, they were going to be the hottest Olympics on record. So they compared admissions into Tokyo hospitals in 2019 and found there was a huge rate of admission for heat exhaustion just amongst the locals in Tokyo. So all the Olympic teams around the world were scrambling to work out how they can keep their athletes cool. Okay? So one of the things that you've seen is the ice vest they wear, the wet towels around their shoulders, all of these strategies keep them cool. But the other thing that keeps them cool is mint. So once again, when you consume mint, the taste receptors on the mouth send a message to the brain. It sends it to the fatigue centre and the reward centre, and the body feels cooler. And, surprisingly enough, when athletes have mint as a swirl or a spray or a lolly, they actually perform better. Their times are quicker, their power output is quicker, and their perceived effort that they put into it is reduced. So that's really, really important for them. So mint was going to be one of the strategies for keeping athletes cool. Now, that's all and well and good because I've spoken about athletes both times here for the rinse and spit and for the mint. But what about the rest of us normal people who aren't godlike in our athletic abilities? Does it have any effect on us? We know that if people rinse and spit with carbohydrate, cognition also improves. So tasks around memory and, um, you know, making decisions is improved. Now, once again, you can't rinse and spit at work either. You'll probably get told off, particularly around COVID-19. So it's effective there. But mint is also effective for cognition. 
So the whole idea of refreshing you and being in a refreshment works. So that when they've given it to people in hot and humid climates, what we find is that their cognitive performance increases substantially. And remember, this is all from not even ingesting the product. It's just been in our mouth. Okay, so it's quite amazing science. The other taste receptors I mentioned earlier. So who can remember what it was? What different taste receptors there were? Salty, sour, bitter. Let's talk about bitter. Bitter receptors. Now, bitter receptors, do you remember that map you saw of your tongue when you were at high school or school and all the zones are linked for different regions and the bitter was right at the tip of your tongue? And they said that was so you could detect the poison straight away before it went too far into your body. Do you remember all that? Well, what we know is that's not actually true. All the receptors are equally distributed around your tongue, okay? But some of them have more... Uh, concentration of those receptors in certain places, but you certainly detect everything in all parts of your tongue. And I remember doing that experiment and going, whoops, there's something wrong with my tongue because I taste sweet everywhere on my tongue. But I won't say anything because everybody's agreeing, so I'll just let it go. But the bitter receptors, once again, they're really interesting as well. They also have this magical G protein in it. And when we taste something bitter, another interesting thing happens we get the message sent up to the brain, and what they see is that there's a dilation of the, you know, the, um, I've forgotten the word now, the bronchial tubes. So all your bronchial tubes in your lungs dilate, which is quite an interesting thing. Why would they do that? Why would having a bitter thing make your lung tubes dilate? What they're actually also found is, from other research, that we know that children and adolescents and teenagers who consume more fruit and vegetables actually have lower rates of asthma. So can anyone see the link? So the vegetables have got a lot of bitter compounds in them, right? And what is possibly happening is that people that are consuming more, the protective effect is through these bitter things that cause the dilation of the bronchial tubes. So really fascinating things about these receptors and how they work. But what it allows and where the investigation is going with this is how pharmacological agents can be used to trigger those receptors and actually cause a dilation of your bronchial tubes. And they're looking at this as potential drug treatment for asthma and other lung diseases. They're also doing the same with mint. So mint also has the same effect. It also improves airflow into the lung. And at UniSA, there's research looking at that at the moment. How can they use these, what we now call pharmacological agents, because they're affecting a change in someone's health, to help improve health? So quite a fascinating area about these little receptors on your mouth that you probably don't notice much, except if you pull one or if it gets a little burnt and it gets inflamed and it hurts. But they have a huge impact on our physiology without being absorbed into our bloodstream. It also highlights the importance, particularly the work on the bitterness, about eating lots of fruit and vegetables. Um, we know that here in Australia, less than 2% of the population eat the right number of fruit and vegetables per day. Does anyone know how many serves of veggies and fruit we're meant to have? Five veggies and how many fruit? Two, yeah. So less than 2% of the population do it. And for those that ordered chips, chip, the chip is no longer a vegetable, okay? <laughs> so you can't count it. Because it's been cooked in fat, sorry, I'm probably not saying the right thing for the pub right here, but it's been cooked in fat, it's high in salt, and the other thing that happens is when you cook potato chips at a high temperature like that is polyacrylamide forms in them. And polyacrylamide is a carcinogen. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's really important that we get out of this thing that chips are actually vegetables. But... And so all the phytochemicals in vegetables are having influences on the receptors throughout the tongue and probably through the GI system. And one of the ways they affect this is by releasing nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, 
we know the mechanism, what it does is actually dilates blood vessels as well as dilating all the bronchial tubes. And we know that people that eat more fruit and vegetables have a lower risk of having asthma as well as having a lower risk of having hypertension and many, many other chronic diseases. So we're still learning so much about the way that these fruits and vegetables and other foods are impacting on our health. But what it's never changed is the message. The message for those of us that are old enough has always been to eat our fruit and vegetable. We're just understanding more and more about how it actually happens through these mechanisms. And the taste receptors are the latest big thing to happen to help the physiology in the body. So that's all from me. I think we're going to go to questions now, aren't we? I'll just take a drink because I'm feeling warm and so I'm going to cool down. So thank you very much, Evangeline. I found that very interesting. I hope that uh, many of you have as well. Um, so we will be going to some um, questions and answers now. As I said, if you can just pop your hand up and then I'll race over with the microphone so we can get it all recorded, that would be fantastic. So I think we've got a question over here. Thank you. Um, I was interested in why you uh, spit um, so you don't uh, digest anything at all? No, so what they, yeah. So you, they could swallow it. So you can swallow it? You can swallow okay. it, but you need to rinse and swirl for 10 seconds. Okay. So the spitting's not overly important then? No, but it looks good, right? No, none of work. <laughs> <laughs> On the field, it looks good. Yeah, but none of work it isn't. No, <laughs> but if you've ever swallowed something you've swirled in your mouth, it's got that mix of the saliva in there and it's warmed up and okay. often so they don't like so nice. it. Yeah. Sorry? And that's right, yes. So I was just often thinking in do. football, they used to have an orange at half time. And is that exactly, perhaps they didn't even realise that that was that boost of sugar that yeah, was uh, yeah, more effective than they ever thought. Yeah, so that quarter of orange that people may consume would probably only have four grams of carbohydrate in it. So for your, you know, Ruck Rover in footy, because we're in the middle of footy season, so your, you know, you know, any of, the, any of the rovers, they run about 21 k's in a game. They actually need somewhere about 60 to 90 grams of carbs per hour. So that orange isn't enough. Um, so what we tend to give them is Gatorade. So one bottle of Gatorade contains about 40 grams of carbohydrate. And then they would have lollies, banana, and we give them those things that we normally don't encourage other people to eat because the glucose is immediate and goes straight into their blood. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, you haven't mentioned allergies at all to food. Yes. And the increase in allergies yeah, to food. Yes. Well, there's so many things one could talk about with nutrition because it covers so many different areas. But allergies are also something that's continuing to rise in the population. And there's a lot of theories about why it might be happening. The first critical one that we know is that breastfeeding is protective for it. So with the reduced breastfeeding rates, we know that there's going to be increased risks of allergen. Also actually avoiding, women who might avoid the allergen during pregnancy actually put their child at an increased risk of that allergen. So if the mother herself doesn't have any allergies, it's best for her not to avoid peanuts and eggs and all those sorts of things. And it seems that there's some seeding, if you like, whilst in utero that helps the baby. We actually know, and we're going to really different areas, that the baby tastes the food the mother eats. And we know they get, they're more likely to eat different fruits and vegetables and more of them if mum during her pregnancy eats a whole lot more as well. Just a question following on from the swirl and spit. Are you saying the body doesn't digest it, but the receptors stimulate a response? Has there been any research into you discovering when the body learns that it's being conned <laughs> and it stops giving that response? Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting thing. So when they do those experiments with athletes, 
they actually try to disguise the taste by putting different things in there. So one of the questions they'll ask in the studies is, could you tell which one was which? And if anyone's been in any study where there's been a placebo and the active treatment, you'll always be asked, could you pick it? Because if you can pick which one's the placebo, then you're going to go, well, I didn't get the right one, so nothing's happened, nothing's worked, right? So yes, they do do that. But surprisingly, we also have the placebo effect. So when someone, and the reason we give placebos is someone's given something and they know it's going to be good for them, they believe it's going to work and it does work. So as an example, if we have a study and they're giving painkillers and they give one group one sugar tablet and another group two sugar tablets, guess who's got more pain reduction? Two sugar tablets. <laughs> if they give tablets versus an injection, so sugar tablets versus just you know, um, yeah, guess who gets more pain reduction? The injection. So we're primed to believe that interventions work, right? Um, so it's quite an interesting area of science and a lot of research is done on it. Um, but it's the power of the belief in what's going to work as well. So, and you often hear athletes saying, I'm going to eat a Big Mac and chips before the game, and you're going, well, you know, that's not so good. It's got this, it's got that in it, you know. And they go, yeah, but when I don't eat it, the team doesn't win. <laughs> so you, you go ahead, and if it's like your Eddie Betts and your Rory Sloans, you don't fight it. Um, if it's young players, they try to train it out of the young players so that they can have the proper thing. But a really strong effect, really strong. Any more questions? I was wondering, amongst the whole issues of depression, anxiety, and that, are there particular foods that, I guess, stimulate well-being? Yep. Not just healthy, I mean, can actually make you feel good. Yep. Um, so certainly, when they've done we have two sorts of studies that we can do in science. One's called an observational study and one's called an experimental study. And the observational study is where we watch a group of people for a period of time. And the experimental study is where we intervene. Now the observational study is really good because it gives us clues about what's happening. But it doesn't prove cause and effect because we've not changed anything. And it could be due to a whole lot of other things that are happening. So you might be going, oh look, you know, these group of people are really happy, they're eating more fruit and vegetables, but what's also happened is they live in Adelaide and they're not under severe COVID restrictions compared to Melbourne, right? So it doesn't allow for that. But the experimental, you say, we're going to change their diet and we're going to see what the difference in effect is. Both types of studies have shown improvements in mental well-being when people eat foods more aligned with the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, which is your two serves of fruit, your five serves of veg, your five to six serves of whole grains, three serves of dairy, and your two serves of meat or alternatives. And it's really strong evidence. And the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, which is really kind of boring, because everyone goes, oh, ho-hum, we want something exciting, <laughs> we want a keto diet, we want this, is actually backed up by 55,000 scientific articles. Okay, so someone has had to sit through and digest 55,000 articles to put it into the AGHE. So that's the first thing. We know that those healthy diets are more protective. Other dietary patterns that we know are protective for cognitive health, be it either the ability to perform better you know, with your mind and your brain at whatever age, and also preventative for depressive disorders, is the Mediterranean diet. Um, and the Mediterranean diet is characterised by being high in fruit and vegetables, grains, cereals, olive oil, and particularly extra virgin olive oil, and very low in meat. So it's almost a flexitarian diet. If you talk to migrants from that era in the 60s, so the Mediterranean diet is coined from the 1960s, not now, because if you go now, they're not eating that. So the 1960s, and if you ask people from that generation, how often did they eat meat? They say they're lucky to have it once every three months. And that was because of the environment they were in, the poverty. If they had a chicken, they weren't going to kill it because it gave them eggs every day. If they had a goat, they weren't going to eat the goat because it gave them milk every day. And so you can say, but isn't milk and eggs animal products? 
they are, but they seem to be more protective because the milk was often not kept as milk because they couldn't store it for a long time. They didn't have refrigerators. So they would make it into yogurt or cheese. And we know that when you ferment these foods, it actually makes it into a healthier product. It introduces the bacteria, and there's a lot about microbiome out there, but it also changes the features of the fatty acids in there, which makes it more protective for heart disease. So last year, the Heart Foundation released a statement based on the scientific evidence that for people that don't have heart disease, there is no need to consume low-fat dairy products. So there is some good news from this. So your high-fat milk, or your normal milk, sorry, it's not high-fat, and cheeses and yogurts are quite healthy and may be protective for someone who doesn't have any heart disease. So the evidence is changing as we find out things. But um, yes, the other thing that's really important is the keto diet. I want to talk about the low carbohydrate diet. As I said, I've been working in the area for 30 years and every time we get a reiteration of people wanting to have low carb diets because carbs cause weight gain apparently. They're really bad, right? And now we're mixing it up with gluten and people are avoiding gluten like crazy. But when you eat food with carbohydrate, one of the body's responses is to release insulin. And what insulin does is it makes sure your blood glucose level doesn't go too high. So for someone who doesn't have any diabetes, we're trying to keep the blood glucose level at about 5.5. If it goes higher, insulin comes in and gets rid of it. And it gets rid of it by converting it to other chemicals, which the body stores for when it needs energy. And that is called glycogen. But the other thing that insulin does is when you eat carbohydrates, insulin's released, and if you're eating any amino acids with it at the same time, it allows the amino acids to go into your brain. And when the insulin levels are high, well not high, but when they're released, the amino acid that's favoured to go into your brain is called tryptophan. Okay? And tryptophan is converted to serotonin. And serotonin is the feel-good hormone like when you're in love or when you see chocolate, okay? <laughs> so people that are going on low carbohydrate diets are actually going to be producing less serotonin because they're not releasing the insulin to help the tryptophan go into your brain. The other problem with low carbohydrate diets, believe me, it's, dietitians hate them, is that they're low in fibre. And the biggest disease we can prevent from diet is bowel cancer. And we know that 25 to 30 grams of fibre every day is protective. If you drop your carbohydrates, it's very difficult to get to that level. The other thing is that the carbohydrates are the sources of all your B-group vitamins. And I don't know if you remember your science well from high school or biochem, but the B-group vitamins actually help produce the energy. So they're involved in the en enzymatic processes that release energy. So you can see that on a number of levels, low carbohydrate diets are quite bad. It doesn't mean you can all go and sneak in lollies and you know, all sorts of things, but it's that moderation of everything that's needed in the diet. Sorry, that was a really long answer, wasn't it? Anybody else got a question for Evangeline? Yes, we've got one up the back. Come down a little bit. Hello. Um, you were mentioning mint and its cooling effect. So I'm curious about um, when we eat really hot things like chilies. Yep. So does that hit the G proteins in our receptors or is that just pain receptors that then make us release endorphins? Yes. So chili contains capsicane and that hits not the G ones, there are other tastes, well, they're the pain receptors in your tongue. And it's warning your brain that you're about to eat something that's going to cause a lot of pain. And so your eyes water, you get sweaty and you're, and you're meant to stop, right? But for some reason we keep going, don't we? But apparently it's very addictive. So where people try to get hotter and hotter chilies, and I can't remember what the scale is called for the chili heatness, but where people get addicted to that feeling and want to have hotter and hotter stuff. But once again, the receptor's warning us, don't be stupid. Um. With the low carb, uh, high, yeah, low carb diet, um, 
Do you differentiate between the high GI and low GI like the, yeah. I mean, what difference does that okay, make? Okay, so the question was with carbohydrate diets, do we differentiate between low GI and high GI? Now, GI stands for glycemic index, and for those of you that haven't heard it, it's the concept of how quickly the carbohydrate in that food is broken down in your stomach and absorbed through the intestinal wall into your blood supply. So you can see there's a lot of variable factors here. Um, it could be how quickly someone's stomach empties. So the gastric emptying rate is something we talk about. And generally, high GI product um, makes your blood glucose rise quickly compared to a low GI. The problem with GI is we don't like it much because there's some foods that are low GI that you know that are just bad for you. So A, Nutella, right? That's a really low GI product and it's low GI because it's got fat in it. And the fat that it's got in there is palm oil and it's saturated. So it's not a good product. Um, whilst white bread has, I think Nutella's about 59, I could be wrong, but white bread is the reference range, and white bread has a GI of 100. Now, I know that whole grain bread is a whole lot better for us, but white bread isn't bad for us, okay? It's still good, um, yet its GI is 100. So that's one of the problems with the GI system. Also, Coke has a lower GI. Ice cream has a lower GI. Um, but the problem is, um, I was going to say, you also eat a meal. So it's rarely, hopefully, that you just eat Nutella, right? You eat Nutella on your bread. I know, we don't need to talk about that. So um, the problem with GI is mixing of meals. And if you have alcohol with it, if you've added oil to your meal, if you've added vinegar, all these things affect it. Um, so the only time we really consider it is if someone's wanting to make a choice within a product for someone who's got diabetes. So, for example, for rice, there's a whole lot of different types of rices on the market and they've got different GIs. And so we would say go for basmati because it's got a lower GI compared to jasmine rice. So it's, that's where we make those decisions. But generally, it's not been as um, helpful as people thought it would have been initially. Is the uh, term that the gut is the second brain correct? Yeah, they call that the, the gut-brain nexus. And they always say a way to a man's heart is through his stomach, right? <laughs> um, so there is indication that there's a really strong neural, you know, nerve centre around the stomach that links up to the brain. And what this does is mainly talk, tell you when you've reached satiety. So we've got stretch receptors in our stomach. So when our tummy is stretched too much, it actually sends a message to our brain to say stop eating. But that's overridden a lot and quite easily. And interestingly, going back to the other thing, breastfeeding, we know with breastfed children, they have a better ability to manage their satiety levels. And if you think about it, um, for those who've had kids and either breastfed or bottle fed, if you bottle feed, you've got a clear bottle and you can see how much milk is left. And if you watch women, They'll try to get the baby to finish all of the milk in the container, right? Um, but with the breastfeeding, you can't tell what's left. You can't tell if there's a little bit left and you don't force it. So breastfeeding also helps with satiety as well as allergy reduction. Any more questions from the group at all? No? We're all good? Um, well, thank you very, very much, Evangeline. Um, that was a really fabulous talk. Uh, very interesting. Lots of things to uh, go home and think about there, everybody. Um, I would like to just uh, give you this little uh, treat. I hope this is um, okay with your diet. A little, a little bottle of healthiness there for you to take home. Yes. And on behalf of the council, I'd just like thank to say you. thank you very much. Thank you to the maid for having this event here. Thank you to our lovely sound guy down the back there. Uh, Stacey down the back from the council has been one of the people organising this. Thank you all for coming. A really good show out tonight. Really fantastic. Uh, sorry we squashed some of you in a bit. Sometimes we don't know uh, how many people are turning up. So uh, really good turnout tonight. So thank you very much. And thanks again to Evangeline. Another My round pleasure. Of thank you.